Hi, welcome to Monroe Live, our podcast here. Today, uh, we are meeting with John Harris, the CEO and founder of Harbinger. Um, but before we get started, my name, again, Paul Turnbull, and I want to give a quick introduction to who I am. Uh, before coming to Monroe and Associates, uh, I worked at General Motors. Uh, I was the technical specialist for electric machine development for all the EVs and hybrid products uh, for General Motors since 2007. So I was involved in the development of the Volt and the Bolt and all of the EVs that are coming out now, which is pretty exciting. So uh, uh, taking that uh, experience and here, bring it here to Monroe to uh, help out with uh, um, our customers with looking at uh, all of the EV and EV related activities. So speaking of that, uh, now we have a chance here to uh, in, to talk with John Harris, um, CEO, co-founder of Harbinger Motors. Um, and so John, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, I've spent most of my career um, focused on transitioning products from uh, concepts into production. Um, I've been in EVs uh, in a few different places, uh, obviously here at Harbinger. Um, I was also a battery lead um, at Faraday Future, um, at Exos. Um, I've been in a lot of different industries. Um, I started my career at Boeing, uh, working in defense. Um, I also worked at Disney, uh, designing toys and consumer products. Um, I was uh, uh, leading one of the programs at Anderil, so back in defense. Um, so I've been kind of all over the the spectrum of um, what I really think of as the the quantity to cost curve, going from kind of Boeing, you know, a couple at a time, a couple hundred million dollars a piece, down to toys where those things are inverted. Wow. Uh, so could you tell me though uh, what uh, initially sparked your interest in uh, pursuing an engineering degree and a career, rather? I guess it it kind of felt inevitable for me. It was. I was always uh, you know, interested in taking things apart, seeing how things worked, uh, designing things. So it, it was it was clear to me from an early age that that was the right career for me. That's great. Um, can you provide an overview of Harbinger Motors and its mission in the electric vehicle industry? Sure. Um, so here at Harbinger, we're focused on electrifying the medium duty segment. Um, this is a segment where we think that the opportunities for electrification are are clear and compelling. The way that these vehicles are used means that they they fit naturally into electrification. Uh, we don't have to change the way customers operate or the way the vehicles are, are used to make electrification fit. So when we look at this segment, we see, we think the best fit for electrification. And yet when we look very broadly at automotive, what we see is that medium duty is the part of the market where there's really not much happening. Uh, there's very little activity here in electrification, but there's also very little activity here uh, in product development in general. Most medium duty products on the road are decades old. And so, you know, we saw that, that real contrast between a market that made perfect sense and a place where no one else seemed interested in making a real effort and thought this is a place where we can make a real difference. So this focus on uh, on medium duty electric vehicles, um, and can you really can you go into more detail on uh, uh, why you decided to specialize on this segment? Mm -hmm. So if we if we think about the whole automotive market to start, uh, it runs from uh, what the the DOT would call class one to class eight. So we've got passenger cars all the way up to long haul trucks. At the bottom end of the market, at the lightweight vehicles, class one and class two, you've got vehicles that are unibody construction. They are designed uh, overwhelmingly for private ownership and, and kind of personal use. And they're optimized very heavily on cost. At the very top end of the market, you have vehicles that are really never used for, for personal use. No one's driving a class A truck to work, I hope. Um, these are vehicles that are entirely commercial in nature 
and they're massively optimized for durability. So you have sort of obvious endpoints in the market. And then in the middle, you have a market where people are just sort of like, eh, let's, let's just stick whatever technology we have into that market and see how it goes. So you end up with vehicles in medium duty that tend to be too heavy and too expensive because people have reused technology from class eight or they're not durable enough because people are trying to reuse technology from class one and class two. But you just end up with a lot of vehicles today that, that don't really meet the customer's needs or that are very, very old. So this segment is um, about three to 400,000 vehicles per year in the US. And by automotive standards, that's a really small market. Um, this market, the medium duty chassis market, it's worth about $20 billion a year. The past car market in the US is um, I think about 10 million vehicles a year. So it's dramatically larger and the result is that when people look at this market, especially from the viewpoint of a big OEM, they look at it and they say, well, that market is really demanding. You know, it has these high durability requirements. It has very high sensitivity to weight. Uh, it's, you know, you can spend more money than you spend in passenger cars, but people aren't willing to pay what they pay for a class eight truck. So it's hard to make a product that fits this market's requirements unless you're willing to make it from scratch. And if you're someone like Ford and you're making, you know, three to four million vehicles a year, you look at this market and say, ah, it's, you know, do we really want to make a new platform for 400,000 vehicles a year? And so you start to understand that there's, there's just this wasteland here where big OEMs don't find it compelling. And again, that's why we see this really compelling niche. It does seem like a growing uh, market as well with all the delivery vans and, and, and growth in the uh, market for personal RVs, uh, that sort of thing. So the chassis that undergrids all of that is uh, something that seems like a, a natural market for an EV, especially the delivery vans where it's uh, people going, uh, you could charge overnight while you're, and then load up and then get out in the morning and drive all day and then uh, get back and charge up again while you're loading. So it seems like a real natural fit for an EV application. Right. You look at a UPS truck and say, well, that vehicle's used 10 hours a day. It parks all night and isn't used for anything. It parks in the same place every night. That place that it parks is an industrial depot. So they tend to have decent power on site already. Um, the vehicle's got a 20 year life. So you've got huge opportunities to save a lot of money with an EV. You sort of put all that together and you're like, well, this makes like this makes even more sense than passenger cars. Right. Why aren't all these vehicles EVs? And the buyers are uh, extremely conscious of the of the operating costs of their right. of their fleet. And that's where the EV product just really shines. Yeah, it seemed I agree. It does seem like a really great. Uh, market, but how does uh, Harbinger differentiate themselves? Uh, you mentioned that you came from XOS, and uh, so there's there are other competitors that are, I think, trying to get into this market. Um, how how is Harbinger Motors differentiating themselves um, with the competition? So this is this is definitely a market where people have been trying for a while. We're by no means a first mover. But you know, we can see already in the rearview mirror that the highway is, is littered with companies that haven't really accomplished much. And really that comes down to appetite for uh, investment in technology. When we look at this segment, overwhelmingly what people have tried to do in medium duty is they say, well, there's a, there's a diesel truck. Let's just shoehorn some batteries into that. That'll be a great product. And you can kind of understand why, you know, maybe that made sense to people in 2005. I'm always shocked that that still is something people think is going to work out, you know, in 2024. Um, if we look back to the, the earliest EVs, they were things like the Volt, um, the Coda vehicle, the Think vehicle, you know, the, the attempts at electrification from 1995 to 2010 were very much in the vein of take a vehicle, an ICE vehicle, and stuff an electric system into it. And no one really wants that product. 
right? I, I always say when you sit in a, 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 a volt, you get a, you know, bump your leg against the transmission tunnel. Now there's no transmission in that vehicle. There's no prop shaft. There's no shifter, but we've got a transmission tunnel there. And that, you know, terrible ergonomic compromise is the result of saying, well, we had a platform and there's a transmission tunnel. So it's still there. It wasn't until Tesla came along with the Model S and showed people that if you're really willing to make an effort, if you're willing to throw everything away and start from scratch with a clean slate, the electric vehicle that you could build is not only competitive, it's a dramatically better product than a gas or diesel vehicle. Now, the passenger car industry had opportunities to learn that in 2010. I think that's been a very tough lesson for the big legacy OEMs to learn. Tesla has been, been teaching them that lesson like over and over again for the last 10 years, but most of them have figured it out right now. You can, you can go and get in a, an ID four or an F one fifty lightning and it's a pretty good product, right? People buy those. They're, they're products that stand on their own. When you look at medium duty, no one's learned that lesson yet. So when you look at uh, Freightliner MT 50 E, for example, which is a competitive product of, to us, you're literally looking at a Freightliner MT-55 diesel engine. And they took the diesel engine out and they put in battery packs from Proterra and a drivetrain from Dana and, you know, aux systems from everyone else. And you sort of have the proverbial, you know, 10 pounds in a five pound bag. And that's the result of that compromise. So what Harbinger has done differently is we started from scratch. Here at Harbinger, we own the complete IP on the entire vehicle. So when you look at a Harbinger chassis, you're seeing a Harbinger frame, a Harbinger suspension system, Harbinger axles, Harbinger steering, Harbinger brakes. You're seeing a Harbinger battery system developed completely in-house with our own modules and our own packs, our own multi-pack architecture. You're seeing a Harbinger drivetrain with an in-house build stator and rotor with a Harbinger transmission. So all of that scope on the vehicle is done here, both the the exciting EV stuff like the battery packs, but also the more mundane automotive stuff like the suspension system and the axles. Those are all Harbinger IP. And that enables us to build a product that is um, significantly more compelling, right? Because we're competing with vehicles that were designed 40 years ago, which is almost an unfair competition. And we also are able to offer something that's dramatically cheaper because we own all of that IP and that capacity. So you know, when we buy an axle, our whole supply chain for the axle is one tier deep, right? You have Harbinger, you have a company that forges metal and we pay for that on a basically per kilogram basis. And when we look at someone like Freightliner, you know, Freightliner goes to Dana, Dana goes to another supplier, that supplier goes to another supplier. And you've got this you know, very traditional three to four tier supply chain with massive amounts of margin capture at every step along the way. Yeah. Having a, um, the system engineering portion gets lost when you're just uh, putting together a kit of components. Uh, complete, exactly. Completely agree with that approach. Um, so what were the, some of the major engineering challenges that you faced when developing a whole platform like this? Uh, it's a monumental accomplishment. So I think, you know, the biggest challenge right off the bat is just there's a ton of scope. Right? It's not just making a battery system or just making an electric motor. It's, it's a whole platform. Um, and when you own that whole supply chain, there's a lot of little parts there. Right? When you design a suspension system and you work with a forging company, you don't just have to design the A-arms. You have to design the ball joints and the bushings and the, the, you know, all the weird little clips, all these little bits and pieces that other people have thought of. You end up having to absorb a lot of that scope to capture those cost savings. Uh, but I think probably the biggest departure in what we're doing here and, and thus one of the biggest challenges was when we looked at the drivetrain. Uh, vehicles in this segment historically use uh, what's called a live axle architecture. So you know, think of any big pickup or big truck, you've got a solid axle, you get the wheels on the end, the whole axle moves as, you know, as one piece. You've got a hard uh, mounted differential in the center and you've got a prop shaft coming in. So that uh, that axle is spectacularly heavy um, on a truck in these weight classes. They're typically thousands of pounds, but more painfully, uh, they're really inefficient. 
because when you have that energy coming in and you want to switch it and go the other way, you've got to move that torque through a 90 degree change. And that's traditionally done with hypoid gear. And you put that energy in in one direction and the energy that comes out, you've lost about 15%. Now, in an ice platform, you're losing half the energy to heat and sound and exhaust anyway. So no one really cares. But when we look at an EV, EVs are phenomenally um, efficient. And we looked at that architecture and said, well, we can't throw away 15% of the energy in the battery packs. That's the most expensive thing on the vehicle. That means we need 15% more batteries. So we looked at that and said, this whole architecture is wrong. Let's start over. Couldn't agree more. The, uh, at Monroe, one of our biggest pain points that we try to get across to our customers is that uh, put the money in to the, the powertrain so that you can save it at the battery because the the battery exactly. is the elephant in the room. Uh, finding ways to gain some efficiencies in the, the powertrain um, always pays dividends uh, when it comes to the battery. And in a, uh, a medium truck application where you're looking at having to move uh, – 12,000 pounds of, of cargo, uh, that that really, your battery situation is, and any any grams that you can save in the battery, uh, and dollars, of course, is going to pay off in, in uh, big dividends. Um, right, and the effect is compounding, right? If you have a inefficient drivetrain, you need more batteries to, to make up for it, but the batteries have weight. So you need more batteries and it just spirals out. Yep. And your powertrain has to be more powerful. And yes, yep. it, it just, yeah. So that, again, system engineering, it's the chance, to, you know, the, the chance to look at the whole big picture and design from ground up uh, is one of the lessons that um, the technology leaders in the industry right now are teaching the legacy automakers. Um you know, we're seeing Lucid uh, make tell the same story. Uh, Tesla has been uh, preaching it for years and uh, putting the cars on the road to prove it. So, uh, and so this is and Harbinger now is doing that in the medium truck segment. That's that sounds like a, a winning proposition. Um, so one of the key things, as to, speaking of batteries, is um, battery technology is just evolving rapidly. And so what is Harbinger's strategy for being able to incorporate, uh, incorporate the newest battery technology as it comes available? It's an assumption that sounds accurate, right? People assume the battery technology is evolving rapidly. But if we look at, uh, you know, if we go take apart a, a Model Y, we're going to find a cylindrical cell with either a nickel cobalt aluminum or a um, nickel manganese cobalt chemistry inside. And if we could take apart the first Model S that Tesla made, we're going to find a cylindrical cell with a nickel cobalt aluminum or a nickel manganese cobalt chemistry inside. So the technology's gotten a lot better, right? Every year we see a 1% to 4% improvement in the energy density of cylindrical cells from leading manufacturers. And by leading manufacturers, I mean uh, Panasonic, Samsung, and LG. So that technology is evolving. Um, rapidly when you look at it in aggregate and say, you know, the energy density has almost doubled in the last 15 years. But the truth is we're, we're pretty much all using the same chemistry that we were 15 years ago. Uh, LFP has become suddenly a big force, but you know, LFP is a chemistry that's decades old. What we've seen is that China's investment in scale has made it very cost competitive and there are kind of open questions as to how much of that is artificial and how much of it isn't. But when we look around and we see sort of everything happening in batteries, you know, solid state and, and lithium sulfur and flow batteries, the stuff is really interesting and really promising. I think in most cases, it's farther from the market than people think it is. So we're always looking for something that's ready at scale, but for us to, to actually consider a new chemistry or a new cell, uh, you know, someone like LG produces, I don't know, 30 gigawatt hours of cells a year. So we need to see scale before we can accept the risk of pulling in a new product. Um, and so I think for us, the question is, 
we use nickel uh, rich chemistries today. And most people ask us, are you going to switch to LFP? Uh, usually they say, when are you going to switch to LFP? Um, and I think for us, that's the question is, is there a point at which LFP is going to get so much cheaper that it's worth the weight penalty for our customers? It does have a, a little bit lower performance. Uh, so it has that cost benefit. But if you can trade the, you have to put in an extra battery in order to get the same performance. So that's the weight penalty for LFP, right? So, uh, and I, it is a little frustrating as, a, as someone in the, the consulting area to see promises made about this wonderful new technology. And then we wait two, three, four years and it, they, right. it, it ends up, here we are with incremental change on the same kind of, uh, same types of batteries. And so the challenge is make the best vehicle we can with what exists today. Well, the other piece is that that incremental change is, is coming every year, right? Every year we're getting a little bit better. And so that means when we look at those more advanced chemistries, when we look at solid state cells, for example, every year, the bar that they need to, to match to be competitive gets a little bit higher. And so there's, I think, an open question with a lot of these chemistries is, are they going to commercialize fast enough to be relevant? Or is the, the march of progress in NCA and NMC going to render them obsolete before they even hit the market? So uh, one of the things that uh, uh, looking at your website that uh, you offer is a, a kind of a modular a scalability for the the battery size for the depending on what the customer needs um, could you talk a little bit about uh, what modularity like that uh, gives you in the way of a market advantage and so when you think about um, about a commercial customer uh, as you mentioned earlier they're very sensitive to operating cost in particular um, but they also tend to know a lot about how they're going to use the vehicles with a much greater level of precision than we we generally have available for our personal car purchases so when we look at a, at a customer, you know, we say, well, here's all the vehicles in your fleet. And let's look at those in terms of how far they drive. And, you know, if we say, well, this bucket of vehicles drives 30 miles a day, and this bucket of vehicles drives 50, and this bucket of vehicles drives 80 to 200, we want to have different solutions for each of those to be more cost effective. So we build one standardized battery pack here. Um, it's a 35 kilowatt hour pack. And then we change how many of those go into the vehicle. So you can have three to six of those per vehicle. Um, so that's um, 105 to uh, 175 kilowatt hours. So pretty big range, but that's reflective of the fact that not only customer by customer, but even within one customer's fleet, they have vehicles of very different use cases. And if we give them more battery than they need, we increase the acquisition cost we make it harder for them to switch to electrification and we make it harder for them to realize all of those big advantages of electrification. So Harbinger was set up with the specific goal of selling these vehicles at acquisition price parity to gas and diesel. And we can't do that if we sell them more vehicle than we need. So how do you envision um, your vehicles impacting the uh, fleet operations of uh, this broader transportation industry? So I think we see two big impacts um, at the large fleet size. You know, think of the, the big publicly listed companies with big fleets. We see an opportunity for these companies to finally start delivering on some of their emissions reduction commitments. Um, you know, big companies talk a lot about how they're going to hit net zero by 2030 or 2040. Um, and they they sign up for the pledges. But when you check back in five years later, it, it often doesn't look like much has happened. And that's not always their fault. In many cases, they kind of look at the technology that's being discussed and they say, well, yeah, that, that seems relevant to us. We're going to make this target and we're going to go get that. And over time, they find that just like those battery chemistries you mentioned, the stuff never really shows up. And so I think a lot of these bigger companies where they have particularly high uh, public scrutiny for their emissions, they're desperate to find ways to meet those targets. They have the right goals and intentions, but someone on the manufacturing side, people like us, have to give them the tools they need to accomplish that work. So I think that's one big impact is at the, the large company level, we'll see an opportunity to reduce emissions by a huge amount. 
at the small fleet level, you know, that's still true on a per vehicle basis, but a fleet of 10 vehicles is, you know, are they producing that many emissions really with 10 vehicles? Probably not. I think at the small and mid-sized business level, we see an opportunity to, to massively improve the margins of these businesses. And I think that's really exciting. Running a small business is very difficult. Uh, you have very hard time accessing capital. And when we look at the, you know, the plumber with five trucks or the, the small uh, uniform uh, service with, with a few trucks, the biggest operating cost of those companies is labor followed by vehicles. And with these vehicles, we can knock down their, their cost of operations by 60 to 70 percent. And they can capture that all as improved profits. Yeah, it's just a compelling. I mean, it, it's one thing to hit your uh, emissions goals, but the economic case of reducing operating costs, uh, a lot of these vehicles and, and fleets are um, getting a bit long in the tooth anyway, and then they needed to, they were looking for uh, a chance to. Uh, make the purchase. And so if you're going to make a purchase now and it's going to be something you don't want to last for 15 years or more, um, why not also have the operating cost savings over that 15 years? And so, yeah, that, right. it, it's, uh, it's just such a uh, compelling case that I think that um, there's a lot of growth opportunity in this market. Um, and the operating costs of these vehicles are, are really staggeringly high. A typical medium duty vehicle is seventy to one hundred thousand dollars, but these vehicles typically cost about twenty thousand dollars a year to operate, and they've got that fifteen year plus life. Uh, in many cases, it's over twenty. So you're talking about spending, you know, five six hundred thousand dollars on vehicle operating costs over the life of that eighty thousand dollar vehicle. Yeah, and it's not just gas. Uh, the the, the brake system, you know, an operator that's got 20 vehicles in his fleet is continuously doing brake jobs. And, and, uh, and with electric vehicles, that can uh, substantially reduce that. So just across the board, uh, uh, gasoline, brakes, fluids, uh, all these things become uh, dramatically reduced as your operating expenses. And just a lot of head, a lot of headaches as well, you know. That uh, so, just knowing that your vehicles are going to get your uh, your people out to the customer's site. Um, that's just uh, we, you know we, we could all use a little less drama in our life for. Uh, and as a business owner, um, that goes double. Um, so, uh, what steps is um, Harbinger taking to? Uh, ensure a sustainable production process for its manufacturing. This is something that has been raised as a, a concern for EV um, transitions, that uh, sustainability of the, of the manufacturing is something, maybe uh, there's some misconceptions about that. There definitely are. I think, you know, I've, I've seen people talk about, oh, there's, there's so many tons of, of earth that has to be mined to make a battery, or there's, there's so many tons of earth that has to be mined to make an electric motor. And it, yes, those are, those are significant. But again, when we look at that kind of life cycle view, when we look at a, a gasoline or diesel engine, um, you got to include all the fuel in that. And so I think EVs are inherently much more sustainable. They're simpler. They have less moving parts. They have less material. And just the fact that they have less maintenance, besides being a cost savings, is a huge improvement in sustainability. And you think about taking the, the brake pads out of your vehicle, that brake pad, like there's some terrible materials in that. That is not a, you know, aluminum can that you can just toss in and recycle. A lot of those maintenance components, you know, used engine oil, brake fluid, these are things that have really big challenges with safely processing and recycling. So an EV to start is just inherently more sustainable because you reduce all of that maintenance. I think for us at the manufacturing level, something that makes a big difference is really a focus on manufacturing quality to improve yield. Uh, when we look at, at building a battery pack, for example, there's a lot of steps, right? You usually start with some kind of structural shell. 
there's an adhesive step, you put cells in it, maybe you encapsulate those cells, um, then you would typically electrically bond them, whether with wire bonding or laser welding or, or uh, ultrasonic welding, and you've got to move through this whole process. And at the end, you hope to get a battery module. Well, depending on all the decisions that you made along the way in engineering and manufacturing, you have some amount of yield at every step. And what we've observed is that a lot of people aren't making the right choices along the way. And so the battery yield is, is really awful. Uh, we know of companies where the battery yield is below 70%. And so, you know, you're, you're mining all this material, you're making the cobalt, you're making the cells, you're doing all this stuff, you're spending all the money, and then some uncomfortably large percentage of your batteries, of your battery modules, end up as scrap. And it's really hard to recycle that, right? If, if we mess up a battery cell at the last step of making a battery module, we probably can't rework that. It's probably not going to be safe. So Harbinger is invested in very simple, highly repeatable manufacturing processes. And the result is that even in pre-production here today, we've consistently seen greater than 95% yield in our battery manufacturing process. And that's a level that you know, many people won't hit for years. So that it doesn't sound like a sustainability focus, but the truth is, if you focus on building these things the right way, you have huge impacts on sustainability and also cost. That's music to our ears here at uh, Monroe and Associates. That's that's uh, something that Sandy has been preaching for years, that uh, the, what, the core of sustainability is doing it right the first time. That's lean design. That's lean manufacturing. And uh, it, it not only makes sense economically, uh, but it makes sense environmentally as well um so that's that is uh, uh one of the key missions here at uh, monroe and associates so our our viewers will will hear that message loud and clear um, so what challenges do you think you face here uh in, anticipating uh as you scale production um as we've been saying that uh it looks like the opportunity is here um and you're off to a great start with some some pretty uh, nice announcements here, I think in May, of uh, $400 million worth of, of business to start. Uh, but yeah, that's going to scale quickly, I think, as, this, uh, as the word gets out on what a compelling business proposition this is. So uh, what challenges do you think that you're going to face when you try to scale this vertically integrated organization? So I think there's two big challenges for a company like ours. Uh, one is that when you're building a vehicle, you need every part. Um, you can't build the vehicle with with 649 of, out of 650 parts. So the execution challenge is, is large. Um, when you're vertically integrated, that challenge is larger because we have a responsibility for quality that goes farther down the supply chain than at most OEMs because we have greater uh, definition of part ownership. So each individual, each individual part may be very manageable we have a lot of parts we have to get right. And so we're growing our manufacturing, supply chain, and quality organization. So the, everything that's really not um, traditional design engineering, those are expanding so that we can maintain close scrutiny of that process. Uh, we have to carry that forward after sales, right? So inevitably every OEM finds that, hey, there's a thing here and you know, the supplier had a quality issue or, or we didn't tighten a bolt far enough or something. And so we have to be prepared after the point of sale to go back and say, hey, with our own you know, rigorous uh, discipline internally, we found that, hey, there's a thing we did that we think we should do it differently. And we've got to have the right organization and the bandwidth to go out and address that, whether that's uh, actually a recall or whether that's a an upgrade or an OTA update, you know, this is something that happens in every OEM. And that means that when it happens, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's our responsibility to plan for that and be ready for it. So that, you know, that sort of whole area of, of what I would call execution challenges, that's I think the biggest one. The second one is something that I won't mention any names, but, but you can see this really evidently in the market is as you start to move into to, um, the market, as you launch products, you have to say no to a lot of things. You have to stay really focused. 
Um, we've seen this over and over again at larger startups in you know, hardware in particular, where there's some early success and then a lot more customers will come in and say, well, hey, I like that thing you're doing. Can you do this other thing for me that's sort of similar? Or can you make me a, a different version of that? Or can you change the pace at which you plan to scale up? And it's really hard to say no to those people. But building the first vehicle, that's you know, that's a, a, an opportunity that we have, right? We have the backing of great investors who said, yeah, this market makes sense to us. And we have basically the, the funding and the bandwidth and the schedule to go and make our launch product. But the company then has the responsibility to make that product successful before we go off and do 10 new things. Uh, my co-founder, Phil, has said that making additional vehicles is a privilege. It's not a right. And if you attempt to make five vehicles from day one, then you, you generally lose that privilege because you're doing too much. The execution drops. Customers are unhappy. And, you know, the, the whole kind of wheels come off the bus there. So a challenge now for us is, is we have to be very disciplined in building this specific product that we've been working on for the last couple of years, launching it, delivering it, scaling it, and then we can start to build the next thing. But the sequencing there is really important. So um, uh, what, what vision do you see for Harbinger in the short term and then uh, medium term and long term coming up? So in the short term, uh, the commercial launch of our strip chassis. So that's the product we've been focused on. That's the product that goes into a commercial walk-in van, a recreational vehicle, some more specialized vehicles in uh, emergency and response. So that's uh, step one. Uh, we've built um, about 60 of those so far. So multiple generations. Uh, prototype vehicles we call mules, alphas, and betas. And we have our SOP in late Q4 this year. So build those, ship them, and then bring production up next year. That's the near-term challenge. In crunch time right now. <laughs> if you're at yeah, start production in uh, a few months, yep, yeah, uh, this that's an exciting time. Yeah, there's that, that last 5% of stuff that, that takes a lot more than 5% of the effort. Yeah. Um, so that's the near-term focus. And I would say that's probably the medium-term focus as well because launching and then scaling up are very different challenges. Uh, next year, we're going to be very focused on primarily increasing the output rate as well as on cost-down efforts. The longer-term effort is really around expanding that product portfolio. So we're building a strip chassis today, but we're doing so with the goal of actually building a cab chassis as the main product. And people have said like, well, the cab chassis market is a lot bigger. Why didn't you just build that? Uh, a strip chassis is a, a necessary element of building a cab chassis. And we sort of said like, well, if we're going to build a cab chassis, we might as well sell it along the way when it's 80% there as a strip chassis. So that's another big project. Um, that's something that we expect to launch you know, in the 2026 ish timeframe. It's definitely an ish on that. Um, but that cab chassis product will expand our market quite a bit. Um, so there's lots of reasons we think that product is compelling. And there are a lot of things that you really can't do effectively today with a strip chassis. Uh, the upfits are more limited. So we see a whole swath of customers to us that would really like an electric vehicle. They really want to access that cost savings and emissions reduction. And we don't really have any way to meet their needs until we develop that cab product. So that's the main long-term focus right now. Um, and I think the other longer term activity is around leveraging our component inventory. When you look at our chassis, you'll see a whole swath of components that you can't buy anywhere that, that aren't available in the market competitively. The obvious one is battery packs and drive units, but we also have here developed internally our own 800 volt multi-zone heat pumps, our own proprietary high voltage distribution system. A lot of pieces that if you're going to build an EV, these are obvious building blocks that you need. And in particular, when we look at lower volume manufacturers, more specialized industries, they don't have the financial ability to develop those components because they don't have the volume over which to amortize them. So we see a lot of opportunities to take that inventory of components and offer that in adjacent industries to leading OEMs who you know, would love to offer electric products 
they just aren't in an industry they can absorb the developmental costs for. So uh, we usually like to wrap up with a quick question uh, on what advice would you give uh, young engineers who are are looking interested to pursue a, a career in engineering uh, um, like the one you've got? This will be a little bit controversial, but I would say my advice, advice to, to new grads in engineering is that you really need to get some kind of structured experience before you can jump into a, an early stage startup. I think, you know, I've, uh, I started my career at Boeing, which is maybe too far on the structure. Um, but, you know, when I sometimes see new grads that are joining these startups of like 20 or 30 people, on the one hand, they get great exposure, right? They get to wear a lot of hats, they get to do a lot of things, but there's elements that you learn at a, at a more mature company that are very difficult to learn elsewhere. Like processes. <laughs> right, like, you know, learning what engineering release process looks like. You're not gonna learn that in a group of 20 people because they're just not gonna do it. Not because they're doing something wrong, but because it's not necessary at that stage. Right. And if you think about kind of where the opportunity cost is, I think a lot of engineers have realized that working at startups, you get to, to have a bigger impact, you have more ownership, it's also much more financially compelling for you. And when you work at a big company, those things are all kind of less. So I would make the case that the time to give up that opportunity cost and work at a large company is at the very beginning of your career where you're not losing as much opportunity. I, that's a great, uh, great take on it. I appreciate your, your outlook. And uh, thank again, thanks again, John Harris, uh, co-founder, CEO of Harbinger. Uh, I really appreciate uh, taking the time of your day to uh, talk to our our uh, audience here at uh, Monroe Live Podcast. And um, again, I'm just really excited for uh, what you're doing at Harbinger Motors. I think that's, uh, you got a really, like I said before, compelling business case on growing this um, in the medium truck segment. Thanks. Well, we, uh, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be on and chat with you and look forward to, to hopefully connecting again after our commercial startup production later this year. All right. Great. Thanks again.